This used to be, this is everybody got the attendance sheet? Uh, this used to be my least favorite chapter, this chapter to talk about. I used to just like dread it and I want to get through it because I just didn't find it interesting. The senses? Sensation and perception, yeah. Uh, I thought the chapter was interesting. Uh, well, guess what? Then I, when I got into media psychology and uh, really started looking into stuff like virtual reality and artificial intelligence and all this kind of stuff, it suddenly became like my favorite chapter to teach. I'm not sure if it's definitely my favorite at this point, but it's it's up there. I really enjoy it. So I'm looking forward to telling you about when this stuff. When are you taking um, a test for biological psychology? Uh, whatever it is on the syllabus, we'll stick to that. I think it's the test opens like next week at some point. And uh, we'll stick to that. And it'll be on whatever chapters we cover up till that point. Okay. So it'll probably be on like three chapters or something. So it'll be less than actually what's on the syllabus, which I think was four chapters. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. I think it was October 5th. October 5th. I, think that was the I don't have the syllabus on in front of me. October 5th is the test. Oh. Yeah, and it said chapters one through four, but is it just going to be on one through three? It will, it'll just be what we up to what we cover. Up to what we cover. Yeah. So I, yeah, I'm guessing that um, I'll look at that when I get home and uh, do that. You said that was going to be online, right? It's online, yeah. Turn so you'll around. have, yeah, I'll go over those day. details, you, you know, when it, when it opens. But it'll open up, you'll have a week to take it. Um, it it'll be timed. Uh, I'm just following the guidelines or whatever the department told me to do as far as uh, giving a test. So you're saying that from October 5th, the test will be open that entire week? It'll be open that entire week that you can access it for maybe an hour. And you go in, so you'll have like one hour, like once you start it to complete it. And I and you'll be oh <laughs> Don, right? Don or Ken? <laughs> um, there, there's um, yeah, you will have one week to access it and take it. And I think it allows uh, like I. I, I didn't make the test yet, but I'm guessing there's going to be like 30 to 50 multiple choice questions. And you have like an hour to, to do that. So it's time. Once you open it, take it. So you won't be able to like look up answers. So you have to definitely prepare for it like it's an in classroom test. Um, but you'll have like at least a minute. It's like a minute or more per question to recognize the correct answer. Back to answer. I'll give you some strategies before uh, next week. We'll, I'll go over some strategies on test taking and things like that. And um, yeah, that's good. Just, you know, if you read all the chapters carefully, you know, I would, it was what I went over last time and how I thought it was a good idea to be careful. Now, um, there are, I didn't, obviously, I just started grading the second batch of assignments, and um, what I just n noticed on the handful that I looked to is you have to please be careful with accuracy. Um, there's some things, like there's information that was discussed in the class, but it was um, something happened between me presenting it, you reading it, and you writing about it in the paper, and that's not everyone, but just be very careful about accuracy. Uh, there was some like very incorrect information that I was reading, which um, I, so in other words, some information got in, but <laughs> not completely. So make sure, you know, you really pay close attention in class that uh, if anything's right, it's an interesting question in perception, because what we know in perception is that everyone in here, including myself, is having a different experience at this moment. And it's, it, it, Immanuel Kant was the guy who taught us this, K-A-N-T, Immanuel Kant, who was 18th century philosopher in the 1700s, and the great con contribution that he made to psychology, what became the science of psychology, he wrote a great deal on the mind, 
Uh, and his big contribution is exactly what we're studying in this class. And that is this exactly. We go through life experiencing the world as if there's some sort of out there environment that's stable and true and remains consistent. When in fact we are participating in the manufacture of re manufacturing of reality. So rather than just looking out and seeing a world or a book or a movie um, or hearing a lecture or seeing something and knowing what it is, in, in actuality, you're participating in making, in making that thing whatever it is you're experiencing. The mind is active, not passive. That was Kant, Immanuel Kant's great contribution in philosophy. And it really, it really shot the trajectory of philosophy of mind, which then became the, the, the science of psychology in the 1800s, late 1800s, that really established this idea that we do reality. We're participating in, in this. And an example, a simple example, might be this. You and your friend go to a movie. And you, you watch that movie, and you love the movie, and you were thrilled about it, and loved it so much, and maybe there were certain characters that you related to in the film or a TV show or something, and then, or the piece of music and what the lyrics meant to you, or if there's music without words, what the music moved you to feel, and your friend completely hated it. They didn't, they thought it was a drag, it was torturous to sit through, they had nothing good to say about it. Now, who's right about this movie? People can argue, I'd suggest you're both right. You both have had your contribution in the reality of what you experienced. Um, that's what we'll learn about in psychoanalysis called projection. The idea that we don't see the world as it is, we see the world as we are. <laughs> and um, I don't know, I, try, I don't know if you'll recall when the, the, one of the classmates in here said in the first week of the, the first day or two of this lecture, of this course, they said something about, oh, you must be good or something like that. And I said, well, I, I wouldn't make that, I can't make that judgment because each of you are participating in what you experience with me. So for some of you, it will be the greatest experience of your college career. I hope you have better experiences. And for others, it, it's the dreaded worst thing you've ever encountered. And it's like wanting someone to fall in love with you. When you feel excited about someone, you'll fall in love. And whether or not they reciprocate that, you can take that personally until you realize, as we know in therapy, and we teach in therapy, as you realize, it really has little to do with you or me, whether someone finds us lovable or not, or attractive or whatever. And incidentally, we go through great, we often we go through great lengths <laughs> to try to be what others will desire in us. When in actuality, has very little to do with us. It has to do with the other person. Just like our interest in who we're drawn to or what we're drawn to is more to do with us than, than that. You know? uh, so Kant really laid out this framework that the mind is an active participant in creating reality. That's the big overlying message that uh, I'd like you to think about while we're doing this. Um, to get us started, I'm going to turn the lights down and show you a little movie. The movies. Is the sunlight interfering? If it is, feel free to drop the shade. Um, this movie is uh, from the Lumiere brothers. Now, as I'm showing you this, This is the first film that was ever seen in public. This, this says 1895, I believe more correctly it's 1898. And it was at the Café Indien, the Indian Café in Paris, and the Brothers Lumière, Lumière in French means light incidentally, uh, showed this first image of a moving picture to the public, the, the first movie showing. And it is said through Folklore. I don't know how true this is, but it is said that when the people saw this image of the train, that they panicked and screamed and thought that there was actually a train crashing through the wall. Now, what becomes very interesting for us is if we watch this 
this film once again. And inc incidentally, the film is, if you see, 40 with the trailer, it should be about 35 seconds. It's 49 with that little introduction. It's about 35, 38 seconds long. And that's because that's the length of film in a projector that was available. All films were limited to about a half a minute. So what is happening on this film? And how is it that much different? Is it much different from our contemporary virtual reality goggles and artificial virtual reality and artificial intelligence and the ability to have emotional responses in the stream, the screen. I mean, we might laugh or find it absolutely silly to think that people thought this was a train crashing the wall, but think about this. Think about the last time you were watching maybe a fight scene in a movie, or like I do when I, I, I like to watch boxing, especially classic boxing matches. Ha, there's T. I like the, the, I love to watch old matches with Larry Holmes and Mike Tyson and these guys. And Muhammad Ali, and I find myself. Do you find yourself <laughs> talking books and stuff like this? And I feel my body tighten up. I mean, think about this. Think about emotional reaction while watching a movie. Tears. You're watching a film that really gets to you, and suddenly tears start falling down your face. And boom! How about the implications of whether or not you're comfortable of expressing that kind of emotion with another person? It's really not that far-fetched from our own experience and our own contemporary experience. The thing that's really fascinating, again, about that film is that if you think about this, one more time I'm going to show it to you while I tell you this. If you think about this, this is an image, a two-dimensional surface. A two-dimensional surface. But yet, we see three, actually four dimensions in this, in this film. Where's my magic doodle? So we have a frame. See the frame? We have a frame. And if we rewind this, we're going to see that, I'm going to start at the beginning, I'm going to pause it. We're going to see that we have three-dimensional representation on a two-dimensional surface. Now, what do I mean by that? Now, just pausing this as a still frame, we have two dimensions, up and down. That's vertical dimension. And we have a second dimension, a horizontal dimension. So horizontal and vertical. That is all that's on this. It's completely flat. Anything that we perceive as depth going back into space is suggested, is a two to three-dimensional representation on a two-dimensional surface. Now follow me because this sounds like, yeah, who cares at the moment, but it's going to get really wild in about two minutes. So we have some cues, it's what we call perceptual cues, depth cues. And some of those depth cues are, well, we have a horizon line. Back there, we also have an implied horizon right here. If you go to art school, this is not anything psychologists discovered. This is something that artists discovered and psychologists followed the artists. <laughs> so these are basic, this is basic drawing class. If, if you get the opportunity to take a sketch class in here in college, you'll learn all these basic, this is basic sketch class. So we have a vanishing point, and that vanishing point is back here. If we were sketching this image. And then we have, going back into that point, you see where this is starting to give the idea? Now we have, here is the train image. And you see how it vanishes back into with in detail. If you notice, the sun might be interfering and it's also high, not high quality. Do you notice that there is, we can tell that this train is late, that this is over the top of this building object that's also extending back into space. So we have little, uh, not only do we have 
um, interposition, the different cues that are giving us this sense, the, the perception of depth in this, we're having um, layered, layered gestalt, they're called gestalt grouping principles, we're having layered monocular depth cues. So we see something that is par partially blocked, not as missing something, that there's something wrong with it, we experience it as it's behind the object that's in front of it. Now this sounds like common sense, but think about this if you're trying to sketch the, the object, how you would make this in reality. You also think, see things that are smaller in distance. So things that are smaller, we perceive as farther away. Things that are larger, we perceive as closer. Things that have more detail. So even in this, um, this uh, poor quality video, we can see more detail in the objects that are closer, and it's like almost like suggested in the background. Things that are less detail we perceive as farther away, things that have more detail we see as close, like more, more close. You can see there's more detail in the train than say in what this appears to be this mountain in the back. Um, we also have shading. There is somewhere here, there's the sun. The sun is somewhere in, in this, on this day, the sun was somewhere. And if we, let's say we take a sphere and we, we want to do the sunlight from this direction, that means, this is kind of difficult to do with a magic marker, but I'll do my best. We would start to see shading you see how the lighted side, this deep, darkish side, and a shadow may be coming in this. Uh oh. Shadows cast elliptically, which is kind of difficult to do. So, pardon my mediocre test of convincing sketching ability, but things like shadows give depth to the objects. So these are all depth cubes. These are all things that give a two-dimensional surface the, the appearance of a three-dimensional depth. Now let's add a fourth dimension into that. Does anyone know the fourth dimension in a moving picture? What do you think? If two dimensions are horizontal and vertical, the implied third dimension, which doesn't really exist, it's all manufactured in our minds, is depth going back in. That's the third dimension. Once I press play, this should give it away. What's the fourth dimension we're dealing with? That's What's that? You said moving. Movement, time. The fourth dimension is time. Now think about this. Without movement, the concept of time ceases to exist. There's a lot of philosophy written on this by someone named Henry Bergson. And what, he, what we find in this situation is the, the perception of time is based on movement. When we have a movie film strip, a movie here, this is, was actually in celluloid, so there was a frame by frame, <laughs> there's a frame by frame, like you made a flip book, you know, if you drew, you know those little flip books you made as a kid where there was somebody dribbling a basketball and the basketball went up and down and you could flip it and make it go faster, make it go in reverse? Well, that's the technology of the film. Every single, every single moment of that image is a frame in a film. And that frame, the, the, the moment where, the, where this frame becomes this to this to this, the experience of movement is what we call time, the, the, the perception of time. Now what I'm going to tell you about this basic introduction to, and I'm, I'm going deep in one direction and then we're going to rewind and start at a very basic level. But the thing that makes this most fascinating, a thing that really turned me on to this chapter, was the realization that this is exactly a removed representation of what's happening in our own minds. And what do I mean by that? Well, what I mean is, 
if we, I'm going to erase this for a moment, if we think about the structure of the eye, here's the structure of the eyeball. The eyeball looks something like this. This is the, there's a cornea, a clear piece of fiber called the cornea. There's this colored ring that surrounds that, the iris, that's muscle. And then directly in the center, there's this absence of light. So when you take a, an anatomy class and you start dissecting this stuff, or maybe you did this in high school, you'll know that when you dissect the eyeball, it's filled with a thick gelatinous liquid called the ocularis humor. It's not humor, it's, it's not funny, it's humor meaning a liquid, a thick liquid. And where that little black dot is in our eye, it, there's nothing there. There's not a little black thing like you're looking for in the dissection tray. There's no little black thing. It's the absence of light, which is pretty interesting to think about. So in here is a lens, and that iris, the colored tissue that you see that we call our eye color, that actually stretches the, the lens thin or thick. And when it's thin, we can see great distances. And when it's thick, we can see up close. You know, And as you get older, that lens loses its plasticity, and the muscles keep it all at one length, which makes it, that's why I'm traveling around with eyeglasses nowadays, because up close, everything's blurry. On the distance, I'm still okay. That's aging-related um, eye segregation. So then, this, there's a tissue along the backside of this, this uh, eyeball. And that tissue is a nerve. It's all sensory nerves. Remember, now you know sensory nerves. That's old school. You know, that's old news. Sensory nerves. Those sensory nerves are special sensory nerves that are sensitive to light. And those sensory nerves are all in this thin thing in the back of the, that surrounds the back of the eyeball called the retina. And that retina is all these nerve fibers little nerve fibers I'm going to tell you about in more detail. And these little light-sensitive and color-sensitive nerve fibers get bundled into an axon. You all know what the axon is, right? Because that's part of the nerve cell, an axon. And they're myelinated from your, from your, uh, from your chapter reading. You'll remember myelination is a glial cell coating that serves as an insulation on that nerve axon so that the, the messages don't get crossed. When that myelin sheath deteriorates, it's called a demyelination disorder, and that's something like Parkinson's disease, and the actual sim signals get crossed because there's no insulation on the, on the wires. And then you try to do something, make a movement, and your whole body kind of short circuits in a way. I sent out a little thing about motor neurons uh, that I saw in the news this week that you could, you might be interested that talks about that. So the optic nerve receives all this information. So when this, see there's a, let's say there's a tree here. The light hits down on this tree. And that light is bounces off of this tree and goes into the lens. And that lens, through that little hole, actually inverts things. So it's on the back of this, what's getting activated here is actually some kind of upside down representation on the back, on the cell retina. Now, if you can imagine and keep in mind how we started out looking at the movie screen, it's all the elements. The retina is a movie screen. Any, I, any thought, if you follow this, this line of, of reasoning, Anything that we're experiencing as space, you know, the depth, I'm standing here and I, if I'm sketching this, I'm seeing two converging outer walls. It's wider here. There's a smaller rectangle in the back. It's the opposite of what you're seeing right now. If you, from your position, you're seeing this as well. You're seeing a big foreground in a rectangular shape that shrinks back to a smaller background. 
um, a smaller rectangle, and you can see these, the, the top two, can you see the, the ceiling two lines converging down? All of that is nothing more than a, a two-dimensional representation, I mean a two-dimensional image on the back of the retina like the movie screen. And any idea that we have that we can actually, by leap of faith, walk back into this, and it's still going to exist, is completely manufactured in the mind. That's Kant's big thing. Space, there's space, and time. What is time? Well, for the movie screen, it's movement. For our experience of reality in everyday life, it is moment-to-moment -moment movement. Without, if, if you can imagine, like imagine in your mind a thought experiment where you could freeze. If we could freeze everything right now, time would cease to take place unless there was some kind of movement in the experience of the pause. <laughs> that sounds kind of strange, doesn't it? But if you, if you spend some time thinking about this, you'll get it. Time cannot exist without movement. They are, they are inferred with one another. So any ideas of space, any ideas of time, are products of the mind, at least in, to some degree. Now, in philosophy and also in psychology, there's great debate about the, in the extreme idea that the mind makes everything up. The term in philosophy is sol solipsism. And it's not something you have to remember, but it's the term, if you hear solipsism, is the idea that things only exist in our mind and nothing exists out there. And I'm somewhat convinced by this, in, in, at least by this statement. The question, as your textbook likes to uh, likes to repeat that age-old question, Hume: If a tree fall, um, if it, if Berkeley, I'm sorry, if the tree falls in the woods, does it make a sound? And many of us like to easily say, well, yes, it does, until you really stop to think and consider that the idea of a tree cannot exist without a perceiver. So in other words, if you, in your mind, if you're thinking that the tree falls, does it make a sound? In your mind, it might be obvious. Well, of course it still makes a sound. It doesn't need me there to make a sound. What do I have to do with it? But imagine no human being exists. There is no human being, and that tree falls. The concept of sound is meaningless. You need a human, as Alan Watts, a great Zen thinker, put it, in order to experience a rainbow, you need three things. You need water, you need sunlight, you know, water droplets, sunlight, and a perceiving eye, a perceiving consciousness of some sort. So maybe you can see now why I got so excited eventually about this chapter, because it really opens up an incredible can of worms about what reality is and how much we have to do with creating what we experience as reality. I'm gonna pause there for a second and see if what, what you're thinking uh, is, is you, you're following the, the line of thought here pretty easily. It's all good. Um, I get a kick out of using historical stuff. As you, you see, I've posted a bunch of examples here uh, on the, the Moodle that you can watch to help you study that illustrate stuff in the chapter. There's a lot of more contemporary videos that you can find on your own. I like the old stuff because I think the vintage stuff is kind of cool. And it's also presented a little more simply in my experience. So then what about the soul? The, the what? The soul. The soul. What, what do you mean by soul? Our soul. What, what, uh, what about it? I'm not I sure. Because you say like everything, <laughs> everything that we like, everything is perception basically. So like, does the soul have to do anything with perception or do you believe that? Well, well, oh, I'm sorry. So do you mean soul like as in the mind, the psyche? Or what's your, what's your, what's your definition you, of soul? I'll just ask you the question of soul. Okay. I get what you're explaining. And that's fine. You're welcome to. Um, just to give you a little something to remember that word soul, if you're talking about the mind, then that would be the idea that the mind is, if not completely responsible, it's somewhat, in, it, it's participating in the making of reality. Um, so soul, I, I'm not sure what you, what is that. It would depend what you mean by soul to answer the question. Yeah. 
But I, as far as mind is concerned, it's the psyche. Which it would be mind, yeah. It would be. Um, now, on the other extreme point of view, which is called naive realism, I'll write this up here. So here's one extreme, naive realism. I'm sorry, solipsism, the idea that everything in the mind, the whole, whole of reality is created by the mind. And naive realism is the idea that the mind is just a passive thing that receives information from out there. And that's very easy to get, and very because that's like what our experience is. Our experience is like, oh, it's out there, and I'm experiencing the out there. <laughs> and that's called naive realism. I don't know of any psychologist's research today that supports the idea of naive realism. We head more and more towards a solipsistic view. However, Kant would lay some would find some place in the middle. And I think that's probably a safe place for us to consider things at this point, that there is something out there that we process, that we are participating in, in processing to create the reality. So this, I've gone abstract on everyone here. I'm going to get a little more simplistic now. I'm going to rewind and go back to some more basics now that you... You might get the gist of things. Your book is going to go into detail about visual perception, hearing, smelling, tactile, feel and sense, heat and pressure, and taste, gustatory. And it's going to tell you, it's going to go into detail about how each organ is built anatomically and how it functions. And I'm only going to reference that a little bit in the context of more higher principles. So you can read that stuff on your own. It's pretty straightforward. And I'm going to mention some of it like I just did here, but it's going to be in service of, the, of the, a bigger picture. So I am going to draw a chart because I love charts. And you don't have to copy this down, but it does help to write something down because I'm going to post it as a slide up on the, the Moodle. Of, I'll draw it out on a piece of paper. So I'm going to start something over here to introduce this. We're going to do the sense. We're going to do the organ as a grand overview. We're going to do the raw stimulus. Raw stimulus. This will make sense as I unpack. Oh, the raw stimulus, as I, as I unpack it, it'll make that sense. And here will be the perceptual, the perceptual quality. Perceptual quality. I'll draw little lines down here. And we're going to look in this chapter at five different senses. The first, I'll start out to describe, oh, this is your next assignment. What, I'm, what we're embarking on right now is to explain this. <laughs> I think the assignment reads something like, what is the sense, the organ, the raw stimulus, and the perceptual quality for each of the five senses? And you just turn this chart into a narrative form. Reference it, in-text citation, <laughs> reference page, Spell check it, do a nice job, and then you get an A. It's easy, easy right? <laughs> it's, it's straightforward. So the sense, the first one we talk about, visual sense. Obviously, the organ involved in the visual sense is the eye. Specifically, the eye, the retina, the sensory nerve, nerves, that are part that build that whole retina. The, the retina is filled with sensory nerves, and those two there are two types of sensory nerves called rods and cones. Rods are sensitive to brightness, lightness and bright an amount of lightness or brightness. Cones are sensitive to color, to color sensation. Here's my trick for you. Yep. Rods are 
active sensor to light, brightness, light, brightness and color. color. Here's how I remembered it when I was doing what you're doing right now. Rods, I thought of lightning rods. And that's bright flash, not colorful, but bright flash of lightning. Cones, I thought of ice cream cones. And ice cream cones always have nice colorful flavors on the top. That's my simplistic way of keeping it straight so I didn't have to, oh, which was which, you know. The thing for you to really just keep in mind is that that sheet, that two-dimensional sheet of nerve, nervous tissue that surrounds the back of the eye and feeds into the optic nerve that goes back to the occipital lobes of the brain where vision, the majority of vision is processed, that is comprised, that retina is comprised of sensory nerves called rods and cones. What's the raw stimulus? I'm talking about the stuff that out in the there, perhaps, that's independent of human perception. Well, I'm not so convinced about what I'm teaching you right now, but this is the gospel. Are you ready for it? It's light waves. The reason I'm not so convinced of this is because, to me, we're just putting another verbal label on something that would take a human being to understand. So my guess is whatever is out there, I have no idea. I don't even think we can talk about it. But I think the best we can do is just come up with some kind of working model that we can somehow use. But I wouldn't call this reality in any way. I don't know anything about reality. I just know from my human experience what's going on. By the way, uh, light waves um, and perceptual quality. What do we see? Color, brightness, distance, the visual experience, whatever we, distance, detail, whatever it is that we space, you know, perceptually. Um, oh, let's put space in here. Instead of distance, we'll call that space, like spatial. And I think we can, in a very abstract way, even put time in here. Because once we have movement, we have time. But that's very, you obviously don't need vision to experience time. But I think that someone who is blind, as you'll read from birth, experiences the world, including time, differently than someone who is has no, like typical no, uh, visual experience. So that's the first part for your next assignment. Any questions or thoughts about, about this? Let's do the auditory sense. Auditory. I love to talk about the auditory sense. We'll go into more detail about this. Hearing. The organ for, the, or for this is the ear. We have, as you'll read in your textbook, and I, I don't want to go into detail about this in this class, but we have an outer ear and an inner ear, as you'll read in your textbook. And sound waves, again, it's all about waves, the surfer says. It's really all about waves. Everything in reality seems to come down to wave functions. <laughs> and it functions exactly like an ocean wave. It's amazing like how incredible this is. The sound waves travel through, just like light waves travel through some sort of substance. Sound uh, light waves can travel through paper and it, it slows slight speed down. Speed of light isn't 100% constant. It slows down depending on the medium that it's traveling in. So if it's in a vacuum, it's always that constant that you learned about. But as soon as, it, as soon as light is traveling through water droplets, it bends and that bend slows down and it's re experienced as color shifts which is why stars twinkle and shift between red and blue at night because it's in a, the, the, the light traveling from that star, uh, 
that little star to your eye is coming tremendous amounts of distances going through different substances and it's making shifts in the speed of light which you're perceiving then as shifts in color. Uh, sound is exactly the same. Sound travels at a certain speed through air. It doesn't travel at all through a vacuum. It needs something to for, for the waves to flow through. You know, uh, It travels slower underwater, which is why when you go underwater, you, talk, you, know, you get that kind of weird effect. Think about the perceptual system of whales and dolphins, which is completely different than ours. And they're entirely, incredibly sensitive auditory systems that exist under the water and how things like speedboats and jet skis and, and big tankers and that interfere with their and, and actually create great trauma to these 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 very intelligent animals mammals that um, interferes with their healthfulness well this is all waves sound waves um, the perceptual quality when you pitch volume things like that few others. I'll explain in a little bit. Timbre is another one we have. That's a French word. It looks like it says timbre, T-I-M-B-R-E, but it's actually pronounced timbre, and in French it means color. And that, as you'll see in a little bit, is the difference between a pitch on a, a playing a C on a piano or an A on a piano versus a human voice singing that pitch versus a flute playing that pitch versus you know, a trombone playing that pitch, it's all the same pitch, but it has a different quality, color to it, timbre, based on the purity of waves that are, that it's, a brass, in other words, resonates in, the, in, a, more, in a different way than vocal cords do, than, say, a, um, a piano string does, or a violin string, and that gives the quality, the color, the timbre of the sound you're hearing. Good basics? Questions? Or, um, it's just the basics at the moment, but any questions or thoughts that come to your mind? Okay, so do you agree with the, um, the theory of, what's the word? Solipsism. Solipsism. I've been probably, the older I get, the more I become interested in it. <laughs> do you think that animals are in a different reality than you? Oh, I don't think we can make too many ideas about what is going on in an in a animal mind. Mm -hmm. Well, I do. There are some things we're getting to next time in consciousness, the next chapter, which we know, for example, how do we know that uh, dogs, say, see in mostly in black and white with some shades of blue? How would we know that? You know enough right now to be able to, or how do we know that a dog can is aware of frequencies and sound? The sound waves for a human being is 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz. 20 hertz is a very low pitch, like the lowest on an organ. 20,000 is really high, the highest you can hear before it disappears. Dogs can hear 50,000 hertz. Now, how do we know light waves? We can see between 400 to 700 nanometers. That's our visual perspective. Perceptual, visual. We, our eyes are set up to be able to do 400 to 700. Does that mean that light waves don't exist beyond what we can see? No, obviously, ultraviolet, infrared exists. Ultraviolet, infrared, above and beyond the spectrum of red and blue, or violet matter. How would we know? So, dogs, of course, and birds, different animals have a different sensory experience of the world just based on their equipment than we do. No differently than our hearing comes in in different ways. Now, how do you know, the question, how do you know, with the information you have right now, how would we know, because no one can get inside a dog's head and say, do you see black and white? How do we know, do you see the colors? How would we know that, that dogs don't perceive color? Some shades of blue, but typically view the world in grayscale. How would we know that? It's a very, you, you all have the knowledge right now to know how to figure this, that how this is easily figured out. And if you said you have the ability to read people's minds. Keep going. Um, Go ahead, Don. The cones 
You, well, go ahead. What are you talking about? What about like the cones? The cones in the eye, that they take those colors and have different lots of them. As a matter of fact, they have very few of them. And the ones that are there seem to be similar to the, to the cones that are sensitive to this thing we call blue. Now, so this is great. They have mostly rods in their eyes. Why would a dog evolve? Because in psychology, we take a biological perspective. Why would a dog evolve to have cones? I'm sorry, rods and not cones. What would the evolutionary advantage be to, for a dog? They also have something else. Their eyes reflect light back inside. There's a coating inside called the, you ready for this, called the placid of lucidum. <laughs> you don't have to remember that. But a dog's internal retina has a sheet of, of reflective material on the cat, too. Lots of animals, raccoons. And that's why you drive at night and the headlights go on and you all have a little kittens looking back at you. The light reflects inside their eyes and shoots back out at you. <laughs> Why would that be on an animal like a dog or a cat? Do you have cats? What does your cat do? Unless your cat's old. <laughs> what does your young cat do at night? All over the house, things are crashing and tearing. And during the day, <laughs> on the windowsill. <laughs> well, they're nocturnal predators. That cat has night vision. The dog is also a nocturnal predator. We're talking in the wild. Animals have been domesticated now, but the dog has all of the, the, the rods in that eyeball and the plasma and the sidium to be able to have like super sensitive night vision. The cats and dogs can see things at night that our eyes can't see, but we, we sacrifice the ability of night vision to have color vision, very vibrant color vision. Fun and fun. It's because color is, we, we've evolved to be more receptive to color vision. So, in certain ways, we can approximate what's going on in the physiological um, experience of animals. But again, it's only relative to what we know about humans. Is that, uh, okay, so we have sound waves. So, the next thing is what? Gustatory sense. Gustatory. The gustatory sense is not just the tongue, but the gustatory bulbs. That's the fancy gustatory bulbs. You know that's the fancy term in science for taste buds. <laughs> Can I tell you a story? I one time was living in Belgium. And if you know anything about Belgium, the things that Belgium is uh, very famous for is beer, what they call pommes frites, French fries, but the Belgians won't call them French fries. They just call them pommes frites, fried potatoes. And the other big thing they're famous for is chocolate. Chocolate. And if you've ever had Godiva chocolate, you'll know why they're famous for chocolate. I got on a subway car once. And Brussels, and I was going to a pianist's house to make some jazz music back in the 90s. And I got on this train, the subway, and I got out of sight of Brussels. I was following his directions, written down, because it was before phone, iPhones, and all that stuff. And I got out of the subway car, and I started walking up the stairs, and all of a sudden, this smell came into my nose. I was like, what on earth? Like, it was thick in the air. And it was so thick in the air that I could actually not only smell it, I could taste it. The air was sweet on my tongue. And I got up the steps and I look around and right in front of me, they call them Godiva chocolates. It was the Godiva chocolate factory. It was like us going out to Hershey Park. <laughs> it's in the Hershey factory. But this was like, whoo, over the top. Years later, I realized that these... There's these chemical substances, these chemical particles, they're all stimulus, a chemical particle, and it floats through the air. That chemical particle gets caught on the taste buds or in the nose, in the olfactory sense. Same chemical particle. These are called 
olfactory scent, the nose, and these are called olfactory, guess what, bulbs. <laughs> olfactory bulbs. It's the same chemical particles get caught in the tongue and the nose, and this is why smell and taste are so closely related. If you want to, if something tastes pretty bad, hold your nose and get the medicine down. You won't taste it as, <laughs> as so fiercely, as potently. So in perceptual quality, well, gustatory, we can talk on a dimension from sour to sweet, dry, Dry meaning like in a dry wine, there's not a lot of sugar in a dry wine. Oh, did, did you guys ever get the, or if you haven't, get the opportunity to learn how to do wine tasting. Wine tasting is the perfect example for the gustatory and olf olfactory. Um, so we, we'll call this tastes, flavors. And we'll call the olfactory smells, whatever those are. Uh, smells. So wine tasting, so if you go, if you're ever watching a movie, you know, when they want to do a, a fancy restaurant scene, you always see someone there with a wine glass and, and the server comes over and shows the label to the person that's ordered it. They then what? Pull out the, pull out the, uh, the cork. And then in the old, they don't do this too much anymore, except in the movies. In the in the, uh, the, the they look at the, they smell the cork. Why would they smell the cork? Anyone know why in the old days they smelled corks? They don't do this anymore. Well, just to make sure that the line didn't turn to bacon. You're absolutely right. It's the first line of defense because years ago, wine didn't have the same type of preservatives and things added to it to keep it from going bad. So in the 1800s, early 1900s, you had to smell the cork to make sure it was, wasn't off. You didn't want to take something that was spoiled. So the first thing was to smell it. Does it smell good? Okay. And then you give a nod. This is the, all the, you know, the fancy stuff to the, mm, that's good. And <laughs> they pour the wine into a glass. Now think about a wine glass. A wine glass looks like this. You ready some more artwork? A wine glass, this is, a wine glass looks like this. It's actually, that's a red wine glass, incidentally, because it has this tapered kind of, this is a scientific instrument. There's a stem on a wine glass. The, the, the server will pour a little bit of wine into that glass. And then what does the person who knows about wine do? Smell it. They, well, not yet, but you, it's it. They take it and they put their hand on the bottom of this, swirl it around, right? And then they hold that wine glass. You can always tell when you're someplace whether someone knows about wine or not by where they're holding the glass. You see, they don't hold the glass up here. They hold the glass down here. Why? So you, I guess they swirl it and they, they smell it. Yes, that's it. But the reason that they hold the stem is because temperature affects the flavor. The, the temperature of the wine is affected by the body heat. So you hold it at the stem so your body doesn't warm up the wine. Because it's ideally served at this one temperature, the cellar temperature if it's red wine. If it's white wine, it could be chilled. So you hold that stem, and then next breathing like you swirl it. And then you look up at it, and what do you look against? If you go to a vineyard, winery, you look up against a white wall. They may even have a white piece of paper or cardboard that you put up against. Why? Because the color that you're looking at, you're looking at the, the color of that wine. The color will be affected by the color of its background perception. <laughs> Where the light source is, what the color of the light source is. Color is not a constant. You look up here and you might see colors here. But actually, if you're an artist and you're looking at this, there are subtle shifts of, color, of darker and lighter hues that are experienced as what? Shades that are perceived as depth. 
you might see a, what you perceive as a wrinkle, but on your retina, it's just a shift from dark to light. So any type of light color or background color is going to affect the color of that perception of that line. Why do you want to look at the color? While you look at the color of a line, so this is a scientific process. It's the perfect example for teaching gustatory and olfactory, I think, olfactory perception. You want to look at the color of the line because that color will tell you its age. A really young wine, maybe too young to drink, but there's a French wine called a Beaujolais that you want to drink when it's the first press of the season. So at, you know, as soon as October is here, by the end of October, November, you can get a Beaujolais for years ago, four dollars a bottle in the supermarket of France. In France, Beaujolais is the first wine, and it's like grape juice. It's bright purple. If you have an, a, the same wine that's been aged for say two years dark and maybe even brownish color because it gets darker as it gets older. So you're looking at the age of that wine. How well did it age? The next thing Ethan said they do is what? Swirl it. Why are they swirling it? They're looking at the viscosity of the liquid. What's viscosity mean? It means it's it thick or is it thin? Here's the kind of, who knows, if this is, if we get away with this anymore, I'm not in the wine world, but they used to call it looking at the wine's legs. If, it, if you swirl it and the wine has really slow moving, nice legs, it, a slower, thicker liquid is probably sweeter, like honey. If it's running real fast and has skinny legs, it's probably not so, so much sugar in it. It's probably a drier wine, so it's dry, sweet. Then, you know, the next thing you do is what? You put your schnauzola in this, this scientific beaker. And when you start to look at wine glasses, now they really look like something in a chemistry lab when you think about this. And you put your nose up in that, and you, you get a good sniff of it, right? And why? Because you want to engulf the, the olfactory bulbs with the smell. Instead of holding your nose so you can't smell it, you want to really super chill. Next time you eat dinner, go over to the dining hall, if you go that tonight after class or whatever you go. And whenever you're eating, go slowly and take time and really smell it and then put it in and chew and chew and really think about it. And you won't believe the flavors that you've been missing out on. Well, the same is true for wine. You get this bouquet of smells and then you put it on your, and you finally what? Put it in your mouth. Now, you swallow. Because in a wine tasting, where you're tasting lots of wine, the idea is that you don't want to get drunk from all this stuff, so you keep spitting it out. But at a restaurant, you swallow that wine. And then when it meets your, when you say, oh, this is good, then you, 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 you make this, do this look. <laughs> and then your date's real impressed. <laughs> oh, 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 you know. It's all, there's a lot of ritual. I took a wine tasting class in college, believe it or not. In college, the guy was a viticult. He was a geography professor and it was his final semester teaching he was about to retire and his passion was wine and to fulfill the geography requirement he offered a class called the geography of viticulture viticulture is vines great vine and he taught us that the secret to of, of having a really good bottle of wine has to do and now he was he was a bit of a different generation. But he claimed that the wine tasted better depending on the ambience of the setting. And specifically, he would always make this joke that it was more to do with if you were playing measies under the table with your drink, with your wine, with your date, or footsies, you know, something like this. And that romantic excitement that came along with the setting and the dim candlelights and the, you know, the little flirtation that that's what really made a good glass of wine, independent of all this other stuff that we're talking about. Again, that's perception. That's, if I can't get any better for social psychology than that example. But yes, right in the wine tasting ritual, it's all about these things. Well, that's why like every romantic movie is like in Paris or France. Cliche, right? Wine. Do you do you know something that's really that I found really interesting? Um, before I got into psychology, for one year I worked in a, a vineyard. Uh, my family were wine growers in Italy. My ancestors, my great grandparents, and I felt the 
the need to kind of sometimes you do stuff with your hands. I needed to connect with that. So I took a job in a, from growing season to working as we touched every vine from the beginning of the season, the growing season to the harvest, clipped the, the went to crooks, crushing the grapes, put it in barrels, doing everything, the tasting, the bottling of the wine, all that stuff. And what I, I learned some fascinating things, and one of the most fascinating things I learned is that women in, in Italy and France, the women, when they want to tell if the wine is ready to be bottled, it's, so it's sitting in these casks, you know, oak barrels usually. And, and um, when the, it's down in the cellar to keep it that cool temperature, and the women go down to smell the wine. Why? Because women have sharper, they have a keener uh, sense of smell than men do. Women tend to smell, now of course you'll find exceptions in this, but in general, women have a keener sense of smell than men do. And that's why they're the first, the, the French traditionally send them down. Now in California, that's all off. It's all done with a little thing called a refractometer. And the, it's all a scientific test. You take the grape juice, you smash it, you put it on this thing, and it looks at how fast the sugar molecules are moving in the instrument. And it turns out that the, the, uh, the California wines are the best in the world. Some of them I argue with me on that, but most people agree that the, the science just really comes through when you're looking at things more from a measurable point of view. Um, I live uh, right on the California border, and uh, in the place I was in, a lot of the economy was driven by uh, vineyards and perception. <laughs> yeah, but the like, you know, wineries would also just have like sit down dinner places, and the um, I, I lost the word, but like the it was always really nice, and the um, environment. I'm spacing the word, yeah. but. Um, ambiance. Yeah, the ambiance in those places was always really nice. But there were wineries like all over the yeah. place where I was. And look how popular they are now. Yeah. In New Jersey and Pennsylvania. Do you know the, the number one grape producer in the United States? The state that produces the most grapes in the United States? You wouldn't be going away in Europe. Pennsylvania. Why? It's the home of Welch's Grape Juice Company up in Erie, Lake Erie area. And they have just a tremendous amount of grape juice grapes, which are different from wine grapes. Yeah. Isn't uh, Oregon and Washington also like have really good wine? Yep, all the everywhere. I mean, some of the there's some great wines in New Jersey. You can so you can do this experience. It's a good way to study, right? Go to the well. You're not 21 yet, so I guess you can't do this, right? Most of you. But if you're 21, I guess you, I can promote this. You can go to the vineyard to study. <laughs> with your, your glass. That was one of the stipulations of this class I took in college. You had to be 21 to take the class. And so there was, it was a small group of us, and it was like 10 o'clock in the morning when this class was running, and we all would have to bring in wines each week to taste and try. And it's like going into lunch, everybody was like, mm -hmm. <laughs> it was a funny class. <laughs> and the guy, the, the guy who taught it was this, like, like, you know, he made, I don't know if he's still alive, this was years ago, but he was like, today he would be fired. I mean, the things that he said were so, <laughs> I mean, it's like, you know, they were so questionable that his sense of humor, the things he would say in the classroom would never, today there'd be lawsuits. You know, that Neezy's in the table, that was just a mild example of the stuff that would come out of his mouth. And we'd all sit there and be like, oh my God, this thing. And this was in the 90s and we knew it was something that wasn't quite good about what was going on. But he knew his stuff. He really knew his stuff with, with this. Um, finally, tactile sense. Tactile sense. That's the skin. I got some very interesting things to tell you about the tactile sense. The raw stimulus, pressure. Uh, and wait, um, somebody help me. Pressure, two S's or one? Two. 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 Good. It looks odd to me, but I see it big. Thanks. And temperature. Temperature. Uh, 
pressure and temperature, and what do we perceptually feel? Hard, soft, kind of continuum. And hot cold. By way of this, I want to introduce you to some very fascinating things about perception. Boy, I learned something this summer, and I can't remember. I got a new book, and I read it. And there was an experiment that I thought William James, who you all now know, who is William James? He was in what? America's first psychologist. He was the founder of American Psychology at Harvard University, 1875. They called him the Pope of American Psychology, the Pope of European Psychology. It was Wilhelm Wundt, same year, 1875. They both started their labs at the same time, but William James wrote these two thick volumes in 1890 called The Principles of Psychology, and they are on my desk. I've read both of them. You wouldn't believe the thickness of these things. Each one is over a thousand pages. They're, they're thick, and it takes a long time to get through them. I got through them because every time I have something I'm interested in thinking about, I say, what did William James have to say? I have yet, this text is over 100 years old. I have yet to find anything in that text that's outdated. I mean, I know that sounds like a big claim, but if you take my, I'm going to be teaching the history of psychology new course here next semester, and that's what I've been teaching for 20 years at Rutgers. If you trust me on this, I have found nothing out of date in that 1890 textbook. We could use it for this class. It's just too in-depth for this class. Um, nevertheless, so he did that. He introduced an experiment in his perception chapter. I said, because I admire William James. So I say, how did he present perception? And he's writing the four movies, so he can't do what I'm doing. <laughs> you know, with the, the Air brothers and the train. But what did he do? He wrote about the bucket experiment. And this is on Moodle. I found a lady who actually demonstrates the bucket experiment. And William James wanted to illustrate tactile, how this tactile sense functions and how slippery it is what we call reality, truth, reality. This is the experiment. He would come into his psychology class at Harvard in the 1800s, 1870s, and 80s, and he'd have three buckets of water in front of him in the class. One ice bucket, bucket of ice water, another bucket of hot, scalding hot water, not scalding, but really hot. You know, not scalding enough to hurt someone, but hot, like hot tub hot. <laughs> Ow! And then the middle bucket, which is room temperature. He would then call a volunteer up from the class and ask this, the volunteer to put their right hand in the ice bucket, ice water bucket, the left hand in the hot bucket, hot water bucket, and after a few seconds, maybe about 10, 15 seconds, take both hands out and put them both in the medium, the room temperature bucket. And then ask what they experience. Well, what they experience is amazing. The hand that the two hands, one coming from ice water, the other coming from hot water, going in the same bucket, the contrast coming from the ice to the room temperature, the right hand felt like it was in scalding water, and the hand coming from the hot water to the room temperature felt like it was in ice cold water. Both hands were in the same bucket of water, but were having two different perceptual experiences of what that temperature of the water is. That to me is the coolest thing ever. I mean, if you imagine just the implications for how we, how sure we are about what we see, hear, smell, taste, and feel in life, and how much of that is influenced by what comes before it and what comes after. Well, that's the stuff of temperature perception. There are nerve endings in the skin, just like there are nerve sensory nerves in these other organs. There are sensory nerves in the skin that are sensitive to warm and cold, not to hot. There are no heat receptors in the skin. You might say, well, how do we experience heat then? We experience heat psychologically. The heat exists in our mind. Do you want to have, you, do, you've all done this. Have you run a bathtub? And you can't remember 
you put your hand under the bath running water and you can't tell if it's scalding hot or ice cold. It's like, have you had that experience? It's pretty, I experience it quite a bit. And you have to wait a few moments. You can actually trick the hand into having burns by combining warm and cold. If you run warm water through a metal pipe and cold water through a metal pipe and you hold it both ends, it'll be experienced as a scalding temperature and the skin will actually get red and in some instances blister psychological. Wait, so heat is psychological? It's psychological. Is that an amazing? I, I mean, this, this, this is why I say to you, I get every year, every day, every year of my life, I go farther and farther into the solipsism camp thinking that, wow, my, I am so, my experience of reality has a lot to do with how I think about things and what I, my outlook. Perceptual set is what it's called. Amazing, amazing. There are social implications for this that we'll talk about later in the course about belief and yeah, how that affects your life. Yeah, does religion have to do anything with this type of well, I theory think... of reality being what we it? <laughs> it's probably, we'll probably get deeper into that in, in, in a different aspect, part of the course, but I think you're on to something very important. What you believe. Uh, I will say to you that uh, someone who's delusional, schizoph like has, has some kind of schizophrenic inability to, what happens when you're schizophrenic? Well, when you're schizophrenic, schizophrenia, it's a broken perceptual sense. The, the mind, like someone who has, a, who has an inability to trust their senses, that's what we call schizophrenia. They wake up in the morning, they look down, and what kind of things do they say? Can I trust that that floor is really there? If I step there, will I fall into the abyss? That is what we call psychosis, a trusting of the sensory information. Delusions, hallucinations. What are hallucinations? Someone who sees, who is so fearful or so convinced that something's chasing them, they actually start to produce visual imagery of, of the thing that's chasing them. And they experience that perception. We know in hypnosis that we can induce hallucinations. You can do positive hallucination. We'll stay this next chapter. We'll do a whole section on hypnosis. And you can induce someone to not be able to perceive something in the room. They walk in, they don't, they've been hypnotized, they walk right into chairs, and then they come up with some justification of why, how did this suddenly get here or whatever. You can also hypnotize someone into in, in, in walking into an empty room and hypnotize them into thinking, there are chairs there, and they will really walk around chairs that are a product of their experience. That's hallucinations. Delusions, beliefs. We talked in social psychology and media psychology now about conspiracy theories and all this stuff. All of these feeding into a certain idea that then becomes so convinced and so much the person's reality that it becomes it's, it's a, a hysteria. A, 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 what do you call this? What's the word? Psychosis. Psychosis. I can't think of the name. It's neat stuff. It's neat stuff. Uh, that should yeah, that should fill up five hundred words for you, right? We got enough to talk about in this. Cite the book. Read the book first. You know, read the chapter. Cite the chapter. Do your nice thing that I saw you do. That a lot of you did. From the lecture and the print in text in the parentheses. That doesn't go on the reference page. It's a personal communication thing. You can put that in the text. But just say your book is referenced. Oh, by the way, do, make sure not to use outside sources. Only cite references that I provide to you for this class. Because you're at the basic level. You know, you're at the beginner level. So I am carefully selecting what you get exposed to. I have a question. So you really can't. Um, oh, um, I'm, I'm going to. I'm sorry, I'm going to put this on the Moodle, so I'm erasing it. Because my friend has psychosis, and, I, and I've now been thinking, you can't, like, it's not that you can't cure it, but you can't, like, help it, right? The only thing you can, like, calm is, like, anxiety if you can't. I love your curiosi curiosity, Jalea. Yeah. I want to say Jalea, so I don't know why I can't see you. Jalea, so that's why I paused. I didn't remember. I did remember it. That's not why I paused. Here's the thing. That is, we're going to get to this stuff. Uh, when we do abnormal psychology chapter. I mean, it's a great thing, and I'd love to talk about it right now. <laughs> but the, the short answer to your question is there's been varied success with different approaches. 
um, in treating psychosis. So it's varied results. It's a good, it's a great topic. And look at this. Um, any, any, any thoughts about this stuff? To give you just let you know on the Moodle, please, please, I beg you, look at the Moodle because I posted cool stuff. How about this one? There it goes. My goodness. Look at this. Here's the lady doing the three buckets test. She illustrates it. You can watch that for a refresher. So that's called the contrast principle. The contrast principle is the idea. I don't know how to. And in the middle, tepid water. It's neither hot nor cold. You're going to take your left hand and you're going to put it into the cold water. And you're going to take your so right she hand goes through this and illustrates it. Into the hot water. That's a very interesting thing. Um, here's some other. This thing it says watch on YouTube. You can click on that. This is long, but it's pretty cool. They're in the 1960s. If you're going back to school before you submit your essays, in the, in the 1960s, there was this art movement called pop art. The whole new way of work. Sensationalism run amok in a very affluent. And this is a really cool. For those of you who like art, this is a really cool documentary on the art installation in New York. And all of the artwork that's presented here, the artists use the perception, the sensory and perceptual stuff that we're kind of discussing in this class. Uh, and they turned it into art. Call it optical art because this is a very limited term, which is included in the, included in the exhibition. Uh, but when we speak about the you eyes see, responding, the it emphasizes the fact that what goes on in these works of art are essentially perceptual experiences. An object which the eye not only looks at uh, the way of ordinary things, but objects which cause the vision and I think one could say, no way. Many of these effects which you see around here are things which we have studied in psychology. The guy talking, Rudolf Arnheim, is one of the most famous gestalt theorists of perception. He might be alive yet. Here's a term I'm going to turn you on to right now, gestalt. I'll tell you what that means in a second. But this that's the guy talking here. Uh, He's written books on visual art, on film. Used in psychology for 30 or 40 years. Um, in psychology for My presentation years. of movement uh, and time grouping came from his by book. Color, which you get so I'm you, giving you my reference. You make a square out of, film is art. out of dots of the same color. You see the square. And one sees ephemeral diamonds of varying reds, which are not, in fact, painted but created by colored dots <coughs> in front of the picture surface, so that your eye fuses an entirely new color. Your perceptual experience does not conform with physical facts. All these so you can watch that if you feel like it is something to help you to make. I would read the chapter first and then watch this. It'll help you to, it'll reinforce what to think about what's in the chapter. Um, while we're at it, Gestalt is a German word. It refers to a school of thought in psychology that I didn't list in the first seven, which most accurate, accurate, accurately today would probably fall into the cognitive psychology movement. Remember, cognitive psychology is the study of the active mind processing information. Uh, uh, what's that? It was the first one, right? The yeah. cognitive, yeah. Um, Gestalt is a, was a German movement that originated in the 1800s in the 19th century by a guy named Max Wertheimer. You'll study about him in the History of Psychology course. Max Wertheimer. In German, the W is pronounced as a V. Wertheimer. And Max Wertheimer 
was very much interest, in, interested in all the things that we talked about here, about the active mind. What made him different from the rest of psychology in Germany at the time, Wilhelm Wundt, Wilhelm Wundt was at this moment more studying a passive mind that received information like the old psychophysicists, that reality was out there and the brain somehow or simply experienced that consciousness. Incidentally, that's what you learned about Wundt in your chapter introduction here. But when you study Wundt in depth in the history of psychology, you'll find out that Wundt came to reject this position at the end of his life and actually thought that experimental psychology would be of little use to exploring anything in higher end processing. And he, Wundt actually in his book, which I'll tell you about next semester, the, it was called Volker Psychology, Volk Social Psychology. He claimed that anything that we have of use to, of depth that is studying the human, the upper complex areas of the human condition is best left to anthropologists, philosophers, and theology, spiritually, like religious people. It's really talk of the soul and stuff like this. You don't hear about that unless you take a history class and study with people who were Wundt scholars. It's interesting. Uh, that's one of those little inaccuracies that you get presented in Psych 101 that by the time you graduate, you realize wasn't exactly true. But Max Wertheimer, he was interested in the active mind, how the mind participates in shaping what it perceives, how we actively perceive. And the word gestalt means in framing. In framing, that's the English, in framing. Now what we mean by in framing is the idea that, let me draw an illustration. Can I find my cool, oh there, that's nice. The in framing is the idea that if you're gonna, let's use visual processing as the example. The Gestalt psychologist talked about all the senses and how reality came to be. But we're just gonna use visual because it's the one that we're probably most familiar with. If you have, how can I approach this easily? Famous study, 1960s, by a researcher with the last name of Hudson, which I don't remember his first name. He went to Americans. He was an American. He went to Americans and he showed them a picture. And the picture looked something like this. And he asked Americans what they saw. This is your typical three-dimensional representation on a two-dimensional surface, right? Remember, here's dimension one, here's dimension two. That's the two dimensions. The three dimensions is the idea that this somehow goes back into space. Well, he asked Americans what they saw, and they would say something like this. This is my sketch, but they might say, Oh, there's a tree off in the distance and a small little shack up close. Reasonable, that that would be a reasonable interpretation. He would then take the same image and go to different tribal cultures that have never that were never exposed to photographs, paintings, movies, never exposed to three-dimensional representation on a two-dimensional surface. All they have experienced is this. <laughs> and what would they respond? Oh, it's a tree floating next to a shack. They did not perceive the depth. Depth perception. This experience is a result that none of us learn, remember learning, but we've all learned to perceive this in our Western culture, in our inundation. To imagine today of the research being done with little babies and touch screens and your cat <laughs> going after the little digital thing, like my cursor on the computer when I'm trying to type and she's you know, nailing the screen and typing all kind of stuff. Um, this is a phenomenon that we learn to perceive culturally. If you're not exposed into learning that this is depth, that depth cue doesn't, it is learnable, but it's not. So Hudson did that research. But how can we, how can I draw this for you that really get this? 
because we're so enmeshed in our culture that we can't even perceive that this is a tree floating next to a shack. It takes a, a bit of a mind bend, but let me see if I can do it. I'm going to draw the picture again, and I'm going to reverse everything to try to give you kind of a crazy perceptual experience. Here's the enframing. You need a frame. You need a frame to make anything work. The moment that you take that frame away, watch this. I'm going to take the frame away. Now, your mind sees it, but if I take that frame away and just show that, your mind, do you get that right now you're seeing depth because you're inferring the frame? But if you were just showing something like this, it might be, who knows what it could be like. I don't know. It could seem like maybe this. I'm kind of surrealist. Now can you see the, the shack floating next to the tree? I've taken away all of the learned perceptual cues, gestalt uh, depth cues. A am I get see, this is something like, it's like one of these things. If you take art lessons or art class, let me see if I can do this. This is psychology is also, also often like this. You can't actually, did you ever draw something by not drawing it? You can sketch a person, a face, anything by, by fleshing out what it's not. What do I mean by this? Hope I can do this. Uh oh. <laughs> Let me try again. Um, uh, what do you do? I think it's this. Now. You see the cube emerge? There's the base. It's like this. See the cube there? Can you now see the cube emerge from the background? So this would be the background and this would be the foreground. This is a perceptual shift you have to do. Um, so, sorry, it's a little sloppy in how I drew that, but it, it, I have to do it too in my mind because I'm not used to doing it. So this is all ideas of enframing. It's the background that we can, um, that, that contributes to the foreground. Here's another, here's another example of this. Face, face. This is a classic example in Gestalt psychology. If you look at this image over here, you see it? Let me put this down. You can, you can look at this and depending, are you able to shift what you see? Can you see two faces looking at each other? Now, can you pause that and see instead a vase, a black vase? Now, here's the real interesting, fun thing to do. Can you see both simultaneously? Are you able to get your mind to perceive both simultaneously? I can do this because I've been doing this for a long time. What is face? I can do it just by looking at it. So you shift the background and the foreground. If you send the faces to the background and the vase comes to the foreground, if you shift the, the attention to making the, the, the white area of the foreground, the black shifts to the background and something else emerges. Now keep this in mind. Do you see that feeling you just got, Ethan? Keep in mind about everyday life. Have you ever, that's what's called an aha moment. This is when you're in everyday life and all of a sudden you say, holy moly, I've been seeing this all my life and I'm seeing this now for the first time. And let me tell you the exciting thing, it's cool when it happens in your teens and 20s. It's really nice when it happens when you're older because you realize that there's still fresh stuff in the world to experience in new ways. It all has to do with perceptual set. A perceptual set is how you enter in the world. 
for therapists, if you're interested in counseling, how do we apply this? Well, the idea would be your client comes in and they present you with one situation and you hear their experience and you're always kind of inverting it and seeing the opposite and bringing the background to the fore and trying to see things that they're missing and offer to them a fuller sketch. Offer to them the experience of being able to see the foreground and, and be aware that there's a foreground and a background and be able to reverse those and also see them simultaneously. That would be insight and therapy. Is that, is that kind of... Yeah. So in order for this to, to the, the foundation, the, the, the gestalt is that total experience. That's what gestalt means, that is framing. The, one of the ways they, they like to call it is that the sum is greater than the total of the parts. The whole is greater than the sum of the parts. So this would be the idea that you can have a whole bunch of car parts in a pile but it doesn't become a car until those parts are organized in a particular systematic way. Isn't that um, mechanism? Is that mechanism or is that? Oh, I think that's a great, I think that's a great, it's a, I think that could be a part of mechanism. Here's the way I like to think of it. Do you ever hear this, uh, these, these ideas that, you know, the mystics like to say we're all the same? We're all, that we're all one, you know, that we're all one with the world and all the mysticism? And it becomes very interesting when you start to realize that, well, you know what? All of us in here are pretty much made up of the same stuff, organized in slightly different ways as human beings. And just a slightly different other way for a chimpanzee. And just a slight little difference for a head of cauliflower. <laughs> I mean, when you think about it, that's how, not how only how similar we are, but how powerful the smallest little change is. But really, this gestalt idea comes to, sh to really reinforce that all the material of the organic world is the same stuff organized in different ways. Are we out of time? Did I see that? Oh, not yet. We still have a little bit I can squeeze out. <laughs> like, I I've talked a lot. What are you thinking? What are, what are your thoughts? Anything? <laughs> I'm trying to process stuff in here. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff to think about. Talk if you want. I I, I, I want to tell you, did you ever um look, yeah, look at those this is we're gonna study this later, but when you go to your movies with your friends or you watch a video, whatever it is you're doing in life, remember this, remember this stuff, these projection, the idea of projection. Swiss psychologist named Herman Rorschach developed these, these ink blots back in the late 18, early 1900s, and they became, you know, standard issue for projective tests for psychologists. And uh, I'm going to show you one card, and just to remember this, we'll just look at card one. You ask a patient what they see here. Now, this is clinical psychology. Now, there's nothing here. There's nothing here. This is arbitrary. The, 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 it's the same card, that one of ten that's used with everyone, but they just, the, when they were originally made, they, you can see a crease right there. There was a sheet of paper. They dropped a piece of ink, blop of the ink. It was actually made from a kid's game in Switzerland. I think it was called Blotto. I, my memory's not too good, but I think it was Blotto. And they would fold that paper over and open up and it have a symmetrical. There is nothing hidden in here. There is absolutely nothing. Whatever it is that you're seeing right now, you are doing. You're projecting yourself onto that ink blot. So for example, just to give you this idea of the active mind, if you're seeing if you're seeing eyes looking at you and they're staring at you and you're feeling threatened and emotional. That's how typically a paranoid schizophrenic responds to this card. If you have someone that says, now this is clinical psychology. We'll get to the more of this, but if you see someone you ask, sometimes you ask, what do they see? And they'll start going into great detail about this little segment right here. Well, chances are that person is an attention to detail person and they're probably an accountant or something like this. Or you know, if you see someone, you just, ooh, big scary, you know, very kind of flamboyant and expressive, 
well, maybe they're an actor or an actress, something kind of expressive like this. There are great um, corollaries between how people react to this and their personality styles. Um, this is all an illustration of the active mind, a projection onto what you're seeing. And you show these 10 cards. I'll, I'll tell you something. The most thing, interesting thing ever happened to me, that's not, that's Herman Rorschach. Here's another one that, you know, this is a very common one. Um, you, some, someone who with anger issues might be seeing in this two people fighting and bloodshed and argument. Someone who maybe has a tendency towards communion, community with other people and love. They say, oh, they're two friends dancing. You know, you read, you hear what they have to say. Here's the most fascinating thing I ever encountered. I was using these with a little kid once. Um, he was between the ages six and eight at the day. I looked at him, I said, what do you, see? the standard is, what could this be? That's what you would ask, what could this be? And you look for themes in what they're describing. And the kid looked at the card, never happened to me before. He reached over, he said, can I hold the card? I said, sure. He took it out of his hand, and he started turning it upside down and looking at it. I said, wow. Never did any adult ever do anything like that with me. They were too intimidated to even, and I thought, well, this kid's a genius. This kid's a brilliant. He was respectful and nice. He said, may I take the card? He took it out, and he just didn't look at this. He started rotating it. And I thought, wow, interesting things are going to come from this, in this kid's life because of his willingness to just break that social, I mean, the, you know, the therapist or the older adult and asking them things, the intimidating situation. And for him to extrovertly show his curiosity and look at it in unique ways, I thought, wow, I wish I was that brilliant. I wish I had that kid's approach to life. You know, I learned from him. But that's the most interesting thing. So I'm not, this is just to give you an illustration and try to drive home this idea of the active mind and perception. We'll talk more about these in uh, like the, a later course, the projective tests. Okay, next time I'm going to show you some of this. The, I brought my music piano because Max Wertheimer used to teach this course, Intro to Psychology at the new school where I went to school in Greenwich Village and we teach the entire course from the piano, illustrating gestalt principles through music. And there are no, there's, I could find no records of what he actually taught, but I know from, there's gestalt principles in composition that I studied. And I'm gonna show you some auditory illustrations of the gestalt visual cues that you're gonna read about in the chapter. I think you might find it really interesting to see how context whether you're coming from hot or cold influences what you experience note to note, chord to chord, and all in the music that we love. Okay, any questions or anything you I'll be, you know, over the course of the week I'll be grading your papers. Give me some I gotta read closely, just because I care about you all. So I'm gonna read closely and do a thorough job. <laughs> okay. So give me don't don't wonder if I forgot. I didn't forget. I'm, I'm getting there a little bit day by day. Anything else? Enjoy your your uh, afternoon or whatever it is now. The evening. <laughs> Thank you. Have a good one. You too.